Hey, everybody. Happy Memorial Day to all in the U.S. Uh, this is exciting. The irrigation system is going on outside, so that's, that's not somebody peeing behind me. Sorry about that. Hope you can't hear it anyway. Just as I started the stream, Bitcoin just shot up 500 points after yesterday's pump, bouncing up from 28,000 to 29,000. So it's been a good weekend so far. Long weekend. Anyway, let's jump in. Yesterday was a situation. Uh, let me make sure this is actually working. Da, 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 da. Yeah, good. We got sound. Um, sorry, I had to turn that off. All right, so let's jump in. Yesterday, I hinted at uh, why I believe the Fed is boxed in, why I believe there's only so many times they can increase interest rates over the coming quarters. And I was overwhelmed with the response of people saying, yes, teach me more about macro. Yes, tell me why they're boxed in. So this is going to be a quick 15-minute kind of PhD course in macroeconomics and things that you need to know and why it's important. So, and it does all pertain to Bitcoin. It is a Bitcoin story. Channels about math, money, and freedom. Well, disclaimer, it doesn't matter. And the story, yes, it is a story about the mathematical relationship between kind of money supply, national debt, interest rates, GDP, and how it all maps back to how you want to position yourself for the future. So let's go. Is the Fed boxed in? That is the question. Now, I believe, in my perspective, there is a diminishing tax base, tax revenue, soaring public debt. Governments have a powerful incentive to keep rates low and keep policy accommodative until there is a great reset. Accommodative means quantitative easing. I know they're going to do a little bit of quantitative tightening, etc. But anyway, there is math behind the logic, and you'll see that in a second. So first of all, I'm going to share with you some horrifying numbers. Um, uh, the big one first is this is the current debt today. This is national debt. It consists of debt held by public intergovernmental holdings, including debt held by Social Security, Medicare trust funds. And that is $30.5 trillion. We'll do a visual of what a trillion dollars looks like in a little while. Stay tuned. This is the interest on debt, okay? the uh, This interest on debt has been up about $20 billion in 120 days. That's a 3.5% increase. And again, that is nearly half a trillion dollars. Remember... Remember those numbers, 30.5 trillion plus half a trillion servicing. As they jack the rates, this number goes up. And this is what the story is about. Let's talk about unfunded liabilities. This is a wake up call for anybody here. And like, although this is a US case study, trust me, they're in worse situations in places like Canada, Europe, maybe other places all over the world, Japan. It's all the same picture. The US is not as bad off as these other places. But look at this number. This is unfunded liabilities. $169.5 trillion. That's 5.63 times the current debt. This is total unfunded liabilities that include things like Social Security and Medicare promises. They are owed, but they are unfunded. And again, nearly six times the national debt. So if you are, say, 20, 30 years of age, and you're hoping for there to be Social Security and Medicare benefits down the line, in 30 years, 35 years, that's not going to happen unless there's a massive reset. It may even be completely unfunded a lot sooner. Now, this is from Truth and Accounting, another visual of what you need to look at. It's another view of how each American owes nearly a million dollars, and there's 350 million Americans. So you can do the math on that. The total U.S. published national debt, 30.8 trillion, is actually 30.5, depending where you go. And the truth is, the actual debt's more like 142 trillion. So if you look at my previous stuff, the unfunded plus the published debt, it's 170 trillion. These guys come up with 142. But if you add 142 to the published number, it's about 172. So call it 172 trillion. A lot of money. Let's talk about debt. Uh, one in 30 odds of debt falling. This is the actual debt profile over the last 30 years. You can see the little arrow. That was 20, uh, the year 2000, sorry. And that was the only year in the last 30 years where debt actually fe fell, i.e. no debt was added to the U.S. economy. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, don't crucify me if I'm wrong, but I think that was uh, under the Clinton president back in the time. But if you look at the debt added in January 2020 in the whole fiscal year, $4.5 trillion. 2021, $1.86, call it $2 trillion. And so far this year, $0.784 trillion. This year is not even halfway over. Ladies and gentlemen, stunning numbers. But again, there's more. So let's look at what this looks like in another profile. 
Now, this looks like a funny upside down looking chart, but let me walk you through it real quick. The debt increase is the blue line and the orange is the deficit. You can see deficits. There was a couple um, of surpluses back in early 2000 as pertains to what we just showed a minute ago. Since then, it has been on a rampage. And remember, this is cumulative. This deficit goes up and up over time, and it's pretty scary. Can anybody see a trend here? And by the way, the green line is the debt added as a percentage of the deficit surplus. Again, scary, scary stuff. But let's go a little bit further. This one is the US budget deficit, i.e. expenses less taxes. So the US spending is about 6.2 trillion and the income receipt is about 4.2 trillion. That's a $2 trillion deficit or gap between what is spent and what is actually brought in. How sustainable is this? So rough back of the napkin calculation for me would be, okay, there's about 75 million people that pay taxes. A lot of them pay very small amount of taxes, but you'd have to pull in an extra $30,000 per person just to cover this deficit for one year. Again, not sustainable. We're spinning off a cliff and it doesn't take a mathematician to figure that out. Now, the government believes the deficit will be one trillion in 2022. But remember, they have rosy colored glasses on and tax receipts will suck as well because the market got hit so hard. So a lot of money is actually made by uh, income capital gains tax and stuff like that. And that's going to be abysmal. Trust me. Uh, and this little poster here has 30 trillion on it, which is the number that we need to get under, but it'll be very hard to do that. Let me explain why. But first of all, visualization of what a trillion dollars looks like. First, on the left-hand side here, you can see the big pile of bills. Remember, these are $100 bills. That's a human on the left with a red t-shirt. And he's also on the right in the very far left corner of a trillion dollars. Can you just imagine? This is like a number of football fields, I think, full of $100 bills stacked four feet high. Again, and two times that is two trillion, and that's what we've added. That's what the deficit will be this year. Again, massive, massive, unfathomable amounts of money that need to be printed to keep this thing rolling. But let's go a little bit further. Now, debt is maturing, and this is a key factor as well, because most of the debt the government has is short-term debt, and it will roll into current prevailing rates once it matures and a lot of that's happening here here's a graphic of what is maturing and what it's going to roll into and the answer is the rate's going to be a lot higher and that's critical for us to look at this is another visual of how the rates of different maturities over time what's happened recently we've gone from zero shooting up real high real fast and uh, remember there's a big increasing interest rate environment in like 2015 and up to 2018 and then a big cut and we're going back that way again. And that has also has a huge impact. You can go back in history and see the impact on GDP in historic interest rates environments. But our debt now is so much higher than ever before. That's the crazy thing. Remember, nearly 40% of money was printed in the last two years. Let's talk about uh, US GDP. Again, another histogram of GDP since the year 2000. You can see here we had the financial crisis where we were pink for a couple of quarters, uh, then we have where we are today. There's a very little, we had the C19 crisis where GDP ran negative, down substantially. The GDP growth rate, it got hit by nearly 30%, but it was a very fast V-shaped recovery. And you can see it returned the next quarter. But now we're seeing the inklings of that little pink piece again as of last quarter, and it'll probably get worse again. Ask anybody, to add insult to injury, we are in a recession, despite what government officials will tell you. We are most probably there right now. Let's talk about GDP concerns and what it all means as well. Sorry about all these charts, but there's a lot to <laughs> walk through here. Um, this key to look at here is at the top, you have your uh, export services and export goods, being the orange and the blue. And at the bottom, you've got the light blue as the imported goods and the light yellow imported services. But the key line to focus on is the black line, which is the net total. And look at the way that has just scaled down. We had that little bump in March, April 2020 upwards because shipping lines and everything was closed. Everything shut down. So we had that little reprieve. But ever since then, it's just been tanking. So the key message here is the delta is increasing 
That means we are importing more than we are exporting. So the U.S. needs a strong dollar to support, to make imports cheaper, to put a dent in this. But if they do that, they need to increase rates, which cripples GDP. We'll talk about that in a minute too. But to be clear, the purchase of domestic goods and services increases GDP because it increases domestic production. But the purchase of imported goods and services has no direct impact on GDP. However, remember, the most important thing, if people buy stuff outside the U.S., they do not buy stuff made in the U.S. That's the impact. Okay, so think of the next TV you buy. Are you buying an American made one or one from Korea? South Korea, I should say. So let's look at another piece. This is also shocking. Forget government debt. This is private debt to GDP ratios. Uh, the government debt to GDP is about 130%. The private debt to GDP today is about 370%. So the US is a heavily levered place and we need GDP to grow or else spin into a debt crisis. That is kind of one of the many red alarm bells you're seeing during this little presentation. So in clear text, quick summary. The US economy is very highly levered, both publicly and privately, and tightening rates beyond a certain amount would blow up a ton of companies that are highly levered, unlike Tesla, etc. And the government will also have to print more money to pay the increased debt service burden. The Fed knows this. I hope the Fed knows this. Now, let's talk about the Fed strategy. It's to engineer a soft landing. This is a cute little comic I found. And in fairness, the telegraphing by the Fed has really helped create an awful lot of demand destruction, which in turn brings wealth destru destruction, which in turn controls kind of spending and brings down things like inflation. But the problem is, um, and maybe they're doing this strategically and on purpose, I'm not sure, but inflation is a bigger beast. Now, what they need to do is obviously, they're not going to be able to fix inflation with their little fishing net, which is increasing rates 50 basis points, 100 basis points, 125 basis points. That's not going to cut it. But what they have to do is cook the number of CPI. That's another strategy. Anyway, this is not about that. So let's look at the Fed hike probabilities from the CME. So we had the 50 basis point in May, and then you target up to 100 basis points. Uh, June, they expect uh, maybe a 50 to 75 basis point increase. July, 50 basis point increase. And then September, another 50 basis point increase. November, 25 to 50 basis point increase. And December, 25 to 50 basis points, which would take us somewhere between 300 basis points and 325 basis points. A lot of numbers, but this is what it really kind of looks like. And this is the crux of this little presentation here. And I'm glad you guys asked for it because I love sharing this stuff. So first of all, I added the increase in debt servicing costs to the existing debt servicing costs, assuming much of the short-term debt rolls into higher rates, which it will. I also took all the debt height projections and probabilities going out to December of 2022. Then I calculated the debt service increase as a percent of GDP and the impact on GDP, thus what I call GDP shrinkage. And in an already negative growing economy, any missteps will spin us into financial Armageddon. And again, I repeat, I hope the Fed knows this. We had 50 base point increase in May. So now we're at 75 to 100. The following ones are on the list. So you got June 15th, 2022, another probably 50 basis points. You got July 27th, probably another 50, depending on what happens. But then they still, according to CME, there's still another 50 basis points planned for September 2021st, November 2nd, and maybe 25 basis points to 50 basis points on December 14th. My point is, I don't think we're going to get beyond two more 50 basis points. That'll be June 15th and July 27th. Because the debt to GDP tipping point is 77%, we are at 130% of that right now. That's the problem. Every time we jack rates, we shrink GDP. Now, a visual of what this looks like is here. This simple chart shows you where we are today. Net, net, as the rates go up, the little red arrow points to where we are today, the actual uh, Fed, Fed rate. Every time they'll plan to increase up until December, that takes up to 300 basis points, the GDP will shrink by a factor of 2% all the way up to 6%. It's actually 5.7%, I calculated. And yes, I realize there are many factors that go into GDP, like supply chains and shipping containers getting stuck and other macro shocks to the system, like war, etc. It's an approximate model, but literally, 
if they go to 300 basis points, they will shrink GDP by another 4.7% easily. And that's the issue. That's why I say they're boxed in. And I think they know that. So let's talk about the choices that JP has. And JP is a good man. He's a kind man. And not saying anything, anything bad against him, but he has two choices. he got to hit the brakes after another 100 basis points, two, two 50s, 50 and 50, or financial Armageddon. And that is basically what I think it could trigger. If they keep going, if they keep increasing rates, they will smash private debt companies. There'll be tons of bankruptcies. Uh, the government servicing debt costs will go through the roof. They're going to have to print more money to service that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's just not a good outcome. I think they know that. So what's the, what is the way out for the Fed right now? One, they're probably going to have to print more money to service debt. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. It's just math. They also need to find ways to debase the currency, thereby reducing debt. And they need to keep down debt servicing costs by keeping interest rates down. They need to keep inflation high, which also reduces the debt, but don't tell anybody. So they need to publish some fake CPIs pretending, oh, we have inflation down to 2.5%, even though it's going up by 10 to 15%. But that's a separate issue. And they need to keep GDP high to keep tax receipts high to service the debt. That's the cocktail. All of this needs to be balanced very carefully with these little fine levers. And they need to engineer that soft landing and not the Armageddon. And I think that's why they're going to cut it at another 100 base points. Now, the final thing, why do we talk about Bitcoin all the time is because Bitcoin is insurance and we need a hedge against this ever, ever increasing chance of a debt crisis, a great reset, a currency debasement that's just going to continue on and on as we go forward. And that's the story. So with that, everybody, happy weekend, happy Monday. And I'll see you all tomorrow for on-chain technical analysis. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to the moderators in the chat. And I love that you guys love this uh, macro stuff. So who would have thought? Anyway, thank you all. Bye.